A pastor uh, tells about the time a friend of his 11-year-old son called their house one day uh, announcing, uh, the little boy announced that he had a problem with spiritual warfare. And the pastor asked him what he could do to help, but the little boy replied he wanted to talk to the pastor's son, a young man named Scott. The pastor was proud that his son was being asked for such heavy spiritual advice, and he later made it a point to ask him how the conversation went. How'd that go, son? Oh, fine, Scott said. He just needed help getting to the next level of spiritual warfare Nintendo game. <laughs> spiritual warfare is not a game, and the Christian life is not a playground. The reality is we have an enemy who's out to destroy us, and to ignore him just makes his job easier. There's a notice from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game that warns hikers and campers to be on the alert for bears that roam the Alaskan wilderness. And it advises hikers to wear noisy little bells on their clothing so that they don't stumble upon a bear and startle them. And it also advises hikers to carry pepper spray in case they do encounter a bear. Could you imagine pepper spraying a bear? The warning goes on to say, it's also a good idea, it's a little gross, but that's just what it says, it's also a good idea to recognize the difference between black bear and grizzly bear droppings. Black bear droppings are smaller and may contain berries and squirrel fur. Grizzly bear droppings contain little bells and smell like pepper. (laughs) A follower of Jesus named Peter knew a thing or two about being personally targeted by the tempter. Peter understood the real and present danger of being devoured by a diabolical enemy, and so he wrote this warning to the earliest followers of Jesus. He said, be self-controlled and alert. Notice that word alert. We're going to see that again later on. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I have a friend who's a a prayer leader and a writer. His name is David Butts. And David says this, I believe 90% of the battle in the area of spiritual warfare is simply being aware that there is indeed a battle going on around us and in us. Butts says we need to look at it from the perspective of physical warfare. He said, can you imagine a group of soldiers in the midst of battle forgetting where they are? Imagine planes flying overhead, artillery firing, bullets whizzing by, and they decide to go on a picnic. Forgetting completely about the battle raging around them, they pack a nice lunch, take off across the landscape looking for a nice spot to sit and eat. As they walk every now and then, one of them gets injured. Occasionally, one is killed, and they stop and they ask the question, how can such bad things happen to such good people? What's your response to such a group of soldiers? Would you think they're warriors with mental problems, failing to comprehend reality? And then he says, so are we when we wander through our days with no awareness of the reality of the spiritual battles that we face. Now, over the years, whenever I talk on the subject of spiritual warfare, I have found there are two equal and opposite errors that human beings are prone to embrace on this topic. One is to ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist. There are people who would convince you to talk of angels and demons and say it's all in your head, it's not real. And listen, you can't fight a battle you don't think exists, much less win it. Two little boys were talking after their Bible lesson one day. They'd been learning about the devil, and little Joey said to his friend, little Johnny, Johnny, you believe all that stuff about the devil. Do you think there really is a devil? And Johnny thought about it in a moment. He said, no, it's just like Santa Claus and the tooth fairy. It's just your dad. (laughs) If someone were to ask, how can you tell spiritual warfare is real? One of the ways we can tell we're in a war is by the existence of casualties of war. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the men and women, the boys and girls all over Central Florida who are the walking wounded. And some manage to find their way into churches like Journey. Max Lucado writes this, I was in an emergency room late one night and victims of Satan filled the halls. A child with puffy, swollen eyes beaten by her father A woman with bruised cheeks, bloody nose. My boyfriend got drunk and hit me, she said, weeping. An old man lying unconscious, drunk on a stretcher. He drooled blood in his sleep. Lucado continues, I'm convinced Satan stalks today, causing hunger in Cambodia and confusion in the Mideast. 
Egotism on the movie screen, apathy in Christ's church, and Satan giggles among the dying. Friends, when we see evidence of so many casualties of war all around us, we can't pretend we're not in a battle. The other extreme error that people are prone to embrace is the error of those who blame the devil for everything. These folks see a demon behind every bush and around every corner. They cast demons out of crash computers and faulty traffic lights. And if their kid gets a bad grade at school, they say, get out, you bad grade demon. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if it was just that easy? They live by the philosophy of the old comedian named Flip Wilson. Some of you don't remember, know who I'm talking about, but some of you do. Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. Listen, every time I sin, it's not necessarily because I've got a demon in me or even that I have a demon whispering in my ear trying to tempt me. Sometimes I sin just because I have bad habits or I'm in a bad mood or I don't feel like doing what's right. And I don't really need any demon to tempt me to sin because I have a traitor living within me that the New Testament writers call the flesh. And the flesh is always looking for the easiest way out and the quickest way in and the most self-indulgent path possible. Lance Witt writes, never forget what you're capable of. Never forget how easily you can rebel. Never forget your potential for evil. So I believe there needs to be a balance. There's a devil and there are demons and they are active today, but they're not responsible for all of our stupid behavior. Somewhere in the middle of these two extremes is the gospel reality that Jesus taught. Jesus teaches that Satan and his demons are alive and well on planet earth. In fact, Jesus and his disciples spent a good percentage of their ministry going head to head with them. They recognized back then they're in a spiritual war with an enemy, a real enemy, and we're still at war today. So there's two things I want to tell you off the top. Number one, spiritual warfare is real, but number Number two, spiritual warfare is personal. It's personal. Paul's letter to followers of Jesus in the ancient city of Ephesus probably contains the best known passage in dealing with the topic of spiritual warfare. Paul wrote, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The word struggle in the Greek means hand-to-hand -hand combat, where there's a constant back and forth of blows, dodges, blocks, and counterattacks. Friends, this is describing an up-close and personal, down-in-the-dirt, hand-to-hand, blood, sweat, and tears kind of conflict. This is a very personal fight for each of us. Other translations render that word uh, uh, struggle as wrestle. And whether you realize it or not, every day you and I are, we're wrestling in a personal battle with a spiritual enemy. And every day the enemy tries to get a new hold on you in some vulnerable, exposed area. Again, Max Lucado writes, Satan is the master of the trap door and the author of weak moments. He waits till your back is turned. He waits till your defense is down. He waits till the bell is rung and you're walking back to your corner. And then he aims his arrow at your weakest point and bullseye, you lose your temper. You lust, you fall, you take the drag, you follow the crowd, you rationalize, you say yes, you sign your name. You forget who you are, you walk into her room, you look in the window, you buy the magazine, you lie, you covet, you stomp your feet and demand your way, and you deny your master. He writes, you need to be aware that your enemy personally fights to cause you to be proud instead of humble, filled with lust instead of love, walking in darkness rather than light, in foolishness instead of wisdom, in anger instead of self-control, in bitterness instead of joy, and drunk with alcohol instead of being filled with the Spirit. Friends, spiritual warfare is real. It's personal. And thirdly, spiritual warfare is primarily a battle for the mind. There are two important passages that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth that help us understand what we're talking about when we're saying the spiritual warfare battles in the mind. Here, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world, world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every what? Thought to make it obedient to Christ. Later on in the same letter, look at what Paul writes about it now. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds 
may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Friends, the battle for the mind is where spiritual warfare is won or lost. NPR, National Public Radio, has a popular radio show called This American Life. Maybe you've heard it. And they featured an episode some time ago called The Devil Inside Me. And the show asked various people if they ever felt like they were under the spell of an inner voice that held them in bondage to unwanted thoughts. Now, we're not talking, it's not a Christian uh, show per se here we're talking about, okay? It's not put out by, you know, a Bible distribution agency. We're talking about National Public Radio here. According to the show's host, he said it was like people had been waiting all their lives for somebody to ask them that question. Here were some of the responses from the interview. A man says, I certainly know the voice you're talking about. Another man says, the voice is irresistible always. I'm in the thrall of that voice. A woman says, it's totally out of control. It's got a life of its own. I can't tame it anymore. Another woman says, I actually have a name for the voice. I call it Stan. (laughs) She may have other issues as well. I'm not sure. (laughs) She said, Stan is the guy who tells me to have that extra glass of wine. Stan is the guy who tells me to smoke. A man says, I remember somehow realizing just how finely calibrated the voice was to every nuance, every part of my feelings, including the feeling I didn't want to smoke cigarettes. And the voice is like, you might as well have another cigarette because this is it, right? A woman who just got engaged hears her voice say, you better try your hardest to make sure he doesn't take that ring away because he's going to find out the truth about you and how messed up you are. So you better distract him with a really thin body. At the end of the episode, the host asks someone, do you feel like the voice is winning? A woman replies, right now, yeah, I think I'm in some serious trouble, to be honest. Friends, struggling with a voice that would lead us into a vice is nothing new. This has been our enemy's primary strategy from the beginning. So Paul alluded to Eve being deceived. I want to go back and look at that first encounter that a human being had with this voice as recorded by the writer of Genesis very quickly. Take a look at the scripture. Now, the writer was more crafty, or excuse me, now the serpent was more crafty, not the writer. (laughs) That's another story. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, look at what he said. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, well, you may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. I want you to notice both how subtly and how savage attempts are made to sow thoughts that slander the character of God. Tim Keller writes, sin always begins with the character assassination of God. And we can see in this story what I like to call Satan's four favorite fabrications that he loves to lodge in our minds. Here's the first one. You should question God's word. It's significant that Satan asked the first recorded question in the creation story. Why is that? Because he loves to operate in the realm of speculation and doubt. Notice what he said. Did God really say? That's a question. At issue here is the trustworthiness of what God tells us. And our enemy loves to get people questioning or doubting the word of God. And that doubt can come in many forms. Sometimes it's the direct attack on the reliability of the scriptures. Sometimes the attack comes in the form of those who believe what the scriptures say about the past, but they doubt the relevancy of God's promises and the potency of God's power for today. Doubt's also raised against the nature of God when tragedies come in life, and you know they do. Even Christians find themselves doubting the love and mercy of God. How could a loving God cause or allow such a thing to happen? If you missed last week's message, Pastor Harvey talked about that. The most disturbing doubt, I think, often comes in the form of getting believers to question the surety of their relationship with Jesus. You see, the enemy constantly works at separating us from Christ. Now, I want to tell you some good news right now. He doesn't have the power to actually do that. But he tries to get us to doubt our relationship with God. And I want to tell you right now, I'm going to take a little aside here. The best way to counter that is with the truth of who you are in Jesus. I want you to look at some great advice I read recently. Stop listening to yourself and start talking to yourself. 
And some of you say, I talk to myself all the time. <laughs> but what are you telling yourself? Stop listening to yourself. Start talking to yourself. What does that mean? Listen to these words written many years ago by a famous preacher named Martin Lloyd-Jones. He said, if you realize that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you're listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself, take those thoughts that come to you the moment you wake up in the morning. You've not originated them, but there they are talking to you. They bring back the problem of yesterday. Somebody's talking. Who's talking? Yourself is talking to you. So instead of listening to the voice of your inner victim that tells us to believe the worst about ourselves, start speaking the words of victory that God has declared that he loves you and he's for you and he's with you. Listen, now, now wait a minute. Listen to what the writer of the Psalms, you say, what, is this based on anything that comes from the scripture? It sure does. Let, let's, let, here's, here's Psalm 42. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Time out. Who's he talking to here? His soul. He's talking to himself. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my Savior, my salvation, and my God. John Piper says this, learn to preach the gospel to yourself. Take that fabulous passage from Romans chapter 8, where Paul wrote about our security in Christ. And say something like this, if God is for us, who can be against us, self? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, self, will he not freely give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against us, self? It's God who justifies. No, it's Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised, self. He's at the right hand of God, and he intercedes for you, self. What can separate us, self, from the love of God? Friends, speak the good news of Jesus out loud to yourself about yourself. Amen. Here's another favorite lie. Here's another favorite lie that Satan likes for us to believe. You're missing out. This is one of humanity's most vulnerable areas. Today, it's described in this shorthand, FOMO. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> You've seen that somewhere. FOMO. What is that? Fear of missing out. Now, here's what I like to do when I teach on this passage. Think about the Garden of Eden for just a moment. Think about it. I want to ask you, how big do you think the Garden of Eden was? I mean, was it an acre? Was it 10 acres? Was it 100 acres? Was it as far as Adam and, I, Adam and Eve could see with their eyes? Let me ask you this. On all those acres, how many trees do you think were on those acres? I mean, do you think there were like 100 trees there? Do you think there were like 1,000 trees there? Do you think there was like 100,000 trees there? Do you think there were like a million trees? And out of all those trees, how many did God say they were not to eat from? How many? One. One. Friends, the nature of Satan's temptation is to get human beings to focus on what they can't or don't have rather than on what they, rather than on what they can and do have. Satan's great lie is you need something you do not now have to be happy, and God doesn't want you to have it. He wants us to judge God's character by our fallen sense of fairness. And I say to you, be on guard against any suggestion that a life fully surrendered to God is somehow incomplete or lacking. Here's another favorite fabrication. You can determine your own standards. Human beings were created to know good and evil by relating all things to God, not self. What God was forbidding was not the right to eat, but the right to determine good and evil apart from him. The temptation was not about what they could or couldn't eat, but how they were relate to relate to God. Adam and Eve erroneously assumed their new mental capacity would allow them to make wise decisions independently of God. And Satan still loves to say today, you don't need God to tell you what to do. You can take charge of your own life. You trust your own judgment. But I want to tell you, every biblical book and the entire history of humanity have revealed that when people stop looking up for their standards and start looking in, they don't produce paradise, but instead a hell on earth. That's why the ancient Proverbs writer said, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. And one final favorite fabrication of the enemy is this. You will not face judgment. The first doctrine denied in the Bible is the doctrine of judgment. Satan said, you will not surely die. And the lie that has held such powerful allure for the human race from the beginning is this. There's no punishment for disobedience. There's no price to pay for sin. But the testimony of scriptures and the reality of life reveals sin always 
pays with deadly wages. So, how do we fight against a diabolical, unseen enemy in an invisible war? I want to submit to you today, we put on God's under armor. You know what under armor is, right? Under armor is a very popular brand of sports apparel. By the way, the guy who invented under armor is named Kevin Plank. Let me tell you just a little bit about him. Plank was a second string college football player at the University of Maryland. Never a star, just on the team. Now he's making a product that is one of the industry leaders in athletic wear. $5 billion, I believe they did last year. Here's the moral of the story. Never dismiss what a second stringer is capable of. Because while the first stringers are getting concussions, the second stringers are on the sideline designing clothes. <laughs> and they're the guys that are going to build you new facilities. Be nice to the people riding the bench. But long before Kevin Plank dreamed up apparel for athletes to wear in their battles on the field, God outfitted believers in his own special kind of under armor for their struggles with Satan. Friends, we dare not underestimate our enemy, but neither do we fear him as long as we remain in uniform. I grew up watching the old Andy Griffith show. And occasionally I still enjoy watching reruns of the Andy Griffith show. Barney Fife was Andy's wimpy but lovable deputy who talked a big game, but in reality was scared of his own shadow. In one episode, Barney drew the, ins the assignment to tell two illegal solicitors who'd set up shop along the highway outside of Mayberry that they had to move along. What they were doing was against the law. At first, they complied because Andy had set up Barney's visit by telling these two that Barney's nervous tics were a prelude to uncontrollable and dangerous rage. So according to Andy, when they saw him <clears throat> clear his throat and tug at his necktie and tap on his gun, they best clear out because who knows what's going to happen. But the men quickly learned the truth from some people in town about the cowardly nature of the deputy sheriff of Mayberry, and they resumed their illegal activity, daring Barney to confront him again. With great dread, Barney goes out to face his defiant foes, and he tells them words to this effect. Now, you may not think much of me, he says, but this uniform I wear says there's a law in this town that I'm sworn to uphold, and you have to obey. This uniform says there are good people counting on me to do my job so that they'll be safe and I'm here to do it. So you pack up your stuff and move along. Well, at first, the poachers don't back down. But when they see the resolve of Deputy Fife, they eventually pack up their goods and they move along. And likewise, God's under armor clothes ordinary people to be able to resist the devil and he will actually flee from you. Here's what Paul wrote to the Ephesian Christians describing God's under armor in Ephesians chapter 6. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind. Be alert. Remember that word Peter said? There's a, Paul said it again. It has to do with spiritual warfare. And apparently we should be alert when it comes to spiritual warfare and always keep on praying for all the saints. Paul's letter to the Ephesian church was written when Paul was imprisoned. It's very likely Paul was chained to a Roman soldier as he wrote those words. If Paul were writing today from an American jail, he might write about a bulletproof vest or a right squad helmet or hiking boots. Don't get caught up in the specific parts of the outfit because the real message that Paul is seeking to communicate is what he wrote to the church at Rome when he said, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because here's a secret. Every piece of this Under Armour corresponds to an attribute of Jesus. The belt of truth reminds me Jesus is the truth and his truth alone can set me free. The breastplate of righteousness reminds me that only Jesus can make me right with God. The shoes of peace remind me that the Prince of Peace has crushed the head of the enemy under his foot and we walk in his victory. The shield of faith reminds me that God is my shield and defender 
and faith in him is the victory that overcomes the world. The helmet of salvation reminds me that no other name in heaven or on earth can bring salvation other than the name of Jesus. The sword of the spirit reminds me that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword and can penetrate spirit and soul. Praying in the spirit reminds me that I have the privilege of communicating anytime, day and night, with the supreme commander in chief who assures me that the battle belongs to him. I like how my friend Rick Atchley, he's a preacher in Dallas. Rick put it like this. The belt of truth will guard against deception. The breastplate of righteousness, of Christ's righteousness, will guard against doubt. The shoes of the gospel of peace will guard against discouragement. The shield of faith allows me to repel attacks. The helmet of salvation renews, helps me renew morale. The sword of the spirit helps me return fire. Prayer in the spirit helps me regularly communicate with headquarters. There's an engaging author, creative writer. His name is John Eldridge. And Mr. Eldridge has wonderful prayer for putting on the armor of God in his book, Wild at Heart. And Eldridge writes this, against the evil one, we wear the armor of God. And he says, how many Christians have read over those passages about the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the belt of truth, and never really known what to do with them? What lovely poetic imagery. I wonder what it means. It means, he says, God's given you armor and you better put it on. Every day. This equipment really is there in the spiritual unseen realm. We don't see it, but the angels and our enemies do. So start by simply praying through this passage in Ephesians as if suiting up for the arena. So I've done this a couple of times in the past. We're going to, uh, in the past, we're going to do it again. We're going to pray this prayer, and we're going to put on the armor of God that Eldridge has put together as we close out today. And I'm gonna, I want you to stand up with me right now. Stand up. Even if you are watching on live stream, I want you to stand up. Stand up if you're in your house or in a hotel room or outside. Just stand up. I'm going to pray through this, and I don't want you to bow your heads. I don't want you to close your eyes. I don't know where that tradition started in prayer. I mean, you know, that sometimes people prayed like that in the Bible. More often, they prayed looking up. I want you to look up. Because I'm going to engage you in what we're about to do here. So I'm going to start praying, and I'm going to tell you what to do. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Everybody put your hand on your waist. Don't put your hand on somebody else's waist. (laughs) We're going to pray about that a different time, all right? (laughs) Put your hand on your waist. Lord, I put on the belt of truth. I choose a lifestyle of honesty and integrity. Show me the truths I so desperately need to know today. Expose the lies I'm not even aware I'm believing. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. Everybody put your hand over your heart like that, like it's a shield. And yes, Lord, I wear your righteousness today against all condemnation and corruption. Fit me with your holiness and purity. Defend me from all assaults against my heart. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. If you can lift up just one foot, just lift up one foot. If you can lift up two feet, I want you to come up here and show us all how you do that. (laughs) But I just want you to lift up one foot if you can right now. All right? Just lift up one foot. I do choose to live for the gospel at any moment. Show me, Lord, where your larger story is unfolding and keep me from being so lax that I think the most important thing today is the soap operas going on in this world. All right, you put your foot down. All right, everybody put your right arm out like that, like it's a shield. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Jesus, I lift against every lie and every assault the confidence that you are good and that you have good in store for me. Nothing is coming today that can overcome me because you're with me. Everybody everybody put your helmet on. Put your heads up here. Thank you, Lord, for my salvation. I receive it in a new and fresh way from you. And I declare that nothing can separate me now from the love of Christ and my place in your kingdom. I just have to say, if someone took a picture of everybody, <laughs> they'd say, that's the largest game, as Simon says, I've ever seen. <laughs> All right. If you got a Bible, hold it up. Or if you don't, hold it up like you got a sword right now. Hold it up like you got a sword. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Holy Spirit, show me specifically today the truths of the Word of God that I will need to counter the assaults and the snares of the enemy. Bring them to mind throughout my day. 
And then we're going to pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying. Just lift your hands up like this. Would you lift your hands up? Finally, Holy Spirit, I agree to walk in step with you in everything, in all prayer, as my spirit communes with you throughout the day. In the name of the one who's overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil, Jesus, our Savior and Lord, we pray. And we all said, Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Amen.